Welcome to Encounter Wargaming, I'm Jay, and today we're going to be taking our final look at the core set for 2nd edition. I'm going to be showing you guys all of the data faxes for the vehicles, as well as all the counters, templates, and all the other paraphernalia you needed to play a game of 2nd edition 40k. <laughs> So here it is, the box set for second edition. This is what the starter set came in. Again, wicked cool artwork. Uh, I loved the artwork from this edition because it was just so goofy and cool. Um, so that is the box. Let's take a good look at it because this is literally the starter set I started with when I started playing this game, which is wicked cool. So I've moved here onto the floor because, of course, this box was too big to fit into the frame with my camera that close to the desk so anyway long story short we're here on the floor and we're going to take a look at this so let's bust her open because this is not actually the contents of the starter set I have here a combined uh, collection of all the stuff from both the starter set and the Dark Millennium set so in past videos we've talked all about the, uh, the data cards, the data what are they called? Data faxes, etc. So we actually have here a bunch of unit cards. Well, I had them all elastic banded, but of course this box set has been kicked around a little bit. So I'll just take that elastic off there. There we go. And let's take a good look at all these data faxes. So to start, we have actually these came in the starter set just kind of um, summaries for your units, but of course, like I say, they only included the ones that are in the starter set. I guess this is just to help get you started. So you've got your Space Orc Goths, the Gretchen Mobs, um, there you go again with the Goths and the Gretchen, because again, like I say, we uh, we pretty much all bought the starter set and started playing with that. So it just gives you, you know, their stats, what the armor, what their guns do, etc, etc. But all that is found in the uh, Codex Imperialis and respectively the Codices later on. Moving on, these are, if I can get that off there, thanks. These are a data, a data facts. So this gave you all of the characteristics and everything for your vehicles. This here is obviously a photocopied one. I think I might have cut it out of one of the books. There it is that gives you all the rules for a Rhino, Space Marine Rhino, right? Show you, oh, here we go. Got the actual Rhino card. I don't know why I had that photocopied one. So there it is. There's a Space Marine Rhino. And as you can see here, it tells you its ramming strength um, and what it does. So strength, damage, and negative modifier. It tells you how many crew members it has. So a Rhino just has one driver. It doesn't have any other crew members. Um, and then, of course, it's speeds, it's slow speed, combat speed, and fast speed. Uh, it is a tracked vehicle, so that probably comes into certain details, whether it's tracked, whether it's a skimmer, etc. Certain abilities affect that, respectively. Uh, it carries 10 Space Marines in power armor, or 5 Space Marine Terminators. That's interesting to note, because in later editions, Rhinos couldn't carry Terminators. But, uh, and there was Land Raiders in this edition, but they, they were rare. People didn't really have them. Uh, because the plastic kit was so old, and I think when I started playing the game, they weren't even selling the old Rogue Trader Land Raider yet. But this is the old Rogue Trader era Rhino. Take a good look at it. It's pretty wild. Um, some people still use them nowadays. Of course, its weapon just has a couple of bolters, as you can see. And those are the rules we're used to seeing for bolters. And then on the back, we actually have all of its locations. So as I was saying, when you hit a vehicle, you roll for its location, right? So uh, for a Rhino, we've got its tracks, its hull, and its weapons. So you roll to hit the track, the hull, or the weapons, um, which makes perfect sense. And then once you penetrated the armor, so you can see here that its tracks have a front armor, of, front and side armor of 15. Its hull has an armor of 20, uh, rear armor being 18, and then its weapons are armor 12. So when we saw weapons cause D6 plus 4, or D6 plus D20 plus 6, they have weird armor penetration rules like that. Um, so of course, you know, a chain fist is going to be able to puncture its hull a lot easier than, say, a bolter who probably wouldn't do squat, because there's no way a D6 plus 4 is ever going to roll at 20, right? And then once you penetrate it, you roll on this damage table. Like I say, they had a different damage table for each location. 
that was something third edition really changed, um, where there was just like a, a glancing and a penetrating table for all vehicles, and then like later in fourth, uh, fifth, sixth, etc., there was just kind of one damage table for everybody. So anyway, there you go. That's the Rhino. We've got the Land Raider, again, showing a drawing, because like I say, the Land Raider model was rare in this edition. I don't think I knew anyone who had one, actually. Because the current plastic Land Raider kit that we have actually came out at the beginning of 3rd edition, and I remember when it came out, because I, I was just blown away by how amazing it looked, it was at the time the largest plastic model game Workshop had ever produced. Obviously later on, in like 4th and stuff, like I said, they came out with the Bane Blade, and then later the Stompa, we have things like Imperial Knights and stuff nowadays, Lords of Skulls and stuff like that, so there has been much larger kits since, but back then, the Land Raider was pretty much as big as it got. And we can see here it has one driver and two gunners, so a little bit different than the Rhino, it just has one single gunner, and of course its um, RAM value is much higher. It has a large amount of weapons on it, as you can see it's got grenades, uh, which can fire out of its auto launchers, that's kind of neat, I thought auto launchers were only for... Huh, that's pretty cool. Um, and then we got a LAS cannon, obviously, and a heavy bolter, which is kind of cool. So I think it had heavy bolter sponsons or LAS cannon sponsons, respectively. Uh, like I say later on, they incorporated assault cannons and things like that into the Land Raider kit, which didn't exist back in this edition. Regardless, just like any other tank, its locations are track hull, and in this case it says LAS cannon, I guess, because you know, that was the only weapon it had, which is interesting, rather than just weapons. What did the Rhino say? Yeah, the Rhino says weapons. Huh. Anyways, there you go. And again, three damage tables, respectively. Oh, there's a different Land Raider data fact. So that's the old Land Raider model, okay? How silly looking is that, right? I think it's kind of cool, actually. So as you can see here, yeah, it just has last cannon sponsons. Uh, there is no hull weapon like there is in future editions. So that's interesting to note. 250 point cost. A Space Marine Dreadnought. Uh, here we go. It actually has a RAM value, which is kind of weird because I believe it had a power fist used in close, yeah, close combat only. Strength 8. It has a RAM value. Huh. I guess this is vehicle's RAM it. It uses its RAM value. Sorry, I had a little glare on the on the light there. Um, I think when vehicles RAM it, it had a RAM value versus their RAM value kind of thing. Because I don't see a dreadnought charging in and just like body checking a tank. It seems kind of silly when I can punch it with its power fist. But uh, yeah, it gave you the choice of multi melta assault cannon, or las cannon. That was basically all you could have on the dreadnought back then. Now they've incorporated again future other weapons and stuff: auto cannons, plasma cannons. Etc. Et and uh, as you can see here, there's much more locations than we saw in the tanks. We only saw the three for the tanks. So in this one, we actually have a differentiation between the legs, the right arm and left arm, and then the body, which is the equivalent of a hull. Um, now, it would be the same damage table for both arms, but it mattered which arm you hit. Unlike, again, weapon destroyed, you could like randomize in future editions. This one. It uh, had a damage table for the arms and differentiating between. So we can see how these locations work and how they're different from vehicle to vehicle, which is why these data slates were necessary. Because you kind of had to have these off to the side of the battle uh, for what weapons, I mean, for what vehicles you included in your list. So again, we're seeing a duplicate card here, this time with a picture. So I bet these came in the, this, this one seems really thin, whereas this one's a lot thicker. So I'm gonna imagine that this one came in the starter set, whereas these ones came uh, either in the Dark Millennium set or in the Codexes. Again, there were data slates you could cut out of the Codexes, I believe, too, and we'll look at those when we look at the Codices. But again, I have duplicates of these cards, and they are slightly different, but I guess they might not have come out with that metal model quite yet when they produced this one that came in the starter set, obviously. Space Marine Bikes. Now, this is something that that really changed later in third and fourth, etc. They made bikes sort of a unit type with a toughness. In this edition, bikes were vehicles, much like any other vehicle. 
Um, and of course, one Space Marine crew, making perfect sense. There's only one dude riding it, unless it's an attack bike, which I believe has a completely different data slate. Um, yep, bolters are its weapons. Moving on. There you go. Rider or bike. So you're rolling whether you hit the rider or you hit the bike. And the bike has an armor value of 10, which I believe was your lowest armor value um, in this edition. So of course there's not a rider damage table. You're rolling on their toughness, much like you would any other uh, model. But uh, the bike, of course, has a damage table like any other vehicle. So that's just something to note that makes things very different. Moving on, we have an attack bike, which just like the bike, except now I believe it has more locations. So here you go, you actually have two crew. You have a Space Marine Rider and a Space Marine Gunner. And of course, you are going to have, yep, again, you hit the crew or the bike, right? There's no side card, I guess, location. You either hit the bike itself or you hit one of the crew. I guess it just takes longer to kill the crew because there's two of them. Uh, I wonder if there is any difference. Let me see if it matters whether you kill the driver or the gunner. Because, yeah, toughness of four, wearing power armor. If the driver is killed, the bike will move out of control for the remainder of the game. If the gunner, until the gunner takes over. Hmm. If the bike hits terrain and cannot cross, it collides with another vehicle, leaving the game table. If the gunner is killed, the bike's multi melt may no longer be used until the driver may still fire the vehicle's bolters. Okay, so that's cool. So if you kill the driver, the gunner has to take over or it just veers out of control for the rest of the game. Neat. Space Marine Land Speeder, take a good look at the old school Land Speeder model, guys. That's pretty wild, right? In fact, recently they've, uh, Forge World has made a new Land Speeder model, which is very similar to this, where it doesn't have all the hull and everything around them. It's literally just like two dudes flying on a thing. And I always found this model hilarious because not only, again, is it kind of silly looking, but this gun up top, if you notice, is actually mounted lower than their heads. So if this gun moved to the side at all, it would literally blow off the head of the space marine in front of it. So I don't think they thought about the, the realism of these too much, but uh, that is the model nonetheless. So there it is. And much like the attack bike, we just have two space marine crew. Um, it has a heavy flamer and a multi-melta, which is interesting to note. Um, I'm not sure if there were options even in this for the uh, land speeders. Now they can have a whole plethora of different weapons options. But just like the bikes and the attack bikes, you either hit the crew or you hit the land speeder. And strangely enough, unlike the others, which are all armor 10, this one has an armor 12 on its side and rear, 10 on the front. And I would imagine that's to represent the fact that the Space Marines are exposed like that, whereas on the back you actually will be hitting um, the back of the vehicle. Anyway, same thing. Damage chart for the vehicle. Wound the Space Marines as if any other. And now we have Imperial Guard land speeders. This is something really interesting to note because back in Rogue Trader, as well as in 2nd Edition, you have the same land speeder model pretty much, except instead of Space Marines riding it, you literally have Imperial Guardsmen riding it. And I believe they took that out in later editions for obvious reasons. But uh, yeah, nonetheless, there is Imperial Guard land speeders. And it's basically the same thing, except that you have an Imperial Guard driver and an Imperial Guard gunner. So I imagine over here. Uh, yep, the toughness of three with a six-up armor save to, to wound the, in the crew, whereas this one would be a toughness of four with a three-up armor save. So there you go. That literally is the only real difference between these two. One's manned by humans and one's manned by space marines, otherwise they're pretty much the same thing. Now we've got a Chaos Space Marine bike, which would be just like a Space Marine bike. One Chaos Space Marine crew. Again, a lot of these things would just be repeated, but they literally made it a different data slate because, obviously, armies um, are different. And Chaos didn't have access to all the same things Space Marines did. And so just, we've been over the Space Marine bike and it's basically the exact same thing. I mean, they just made it black instead of blue. Space Marine Dreadnought, or Chaos Space Marine Dreadnought, just like the Space Marine Dreadnought. Um, However, it has a heavy plasma gun, so there you go. 
I guess the Chaos Space Marine Dreadnought came stock with a plasma cannon rather than the LAS cannon that was on the uh, Loyal Marine one. And uh, we'll have to check the codex codexes when we get into that later, guys. Um, because uh, I'm not sure if there were different weapon options or if you were forced to take these weapon options. But we'll find out later on down the road when we get to the codexes. So a Space Marine Predator, ready to go, with the old dome sort of turret. Check that out. In fact, uh, yep, there we go. I've got the one that shows the actual model. There's the old Rogue Trader Predator. Pretty cool, right? Uh, so it looks like it's pretty much the same as a Rhino as far as like its, its speeds and its ramming value and all that. Comes with two LAS cannons and an auto cannon. There you go with auto launchers, so that would be your, your smoke launchers. Um, it's interesting to note that in this edition you could fire grenades out of those auto launchers. I guess smoke grenades were a specific grenade type, right? Hmm. Whereas in later editions it was just smoke or nothing. So that's kind of cool. I, like, I kind of like the idea that it fires grenades actually. They should bring that kind of stuff back. Now this one has four locations. Because that's a turret as well. So again, you gotta understand with these enclosed tanks, you're not there's no chance you're gonna hit the crew. If you notice the crew is not a location on the Rhino or on the Land Raider or on the Predator, you're literally hitting the tank. You, there's no chance you're gonna hit the crew. Right? And that being that. Four different damage tables respectively. Boom. So actually I have a lot of these Predator ones. There's another Rhino one. Again, interesting to note how they lay them out differently. I wonder which one came in the starter set, which one came in the... Huh. Cool. Anyway, that was Space Marine Rhino. Lehman Russ Battle Tank. Now, again, it's interesting to note that... Um, uh, Lehman Russes could be taken in any Imperial Army, so Space Marines could have them as well. But I don't believe there's a variant where Space Marines are driving it. Much like the land speeder that was taken by either army, it actually had a difference of crew. In this one, it's uh, it's Imperial Guard crew. So you've actually got one Imperial Guard driver and four Imperial Guard gunners, which is interesting to note because I guess because you have a hull weapon, two sponsor weapons, and a turret weapon, so that would literally be four gunners. Uh, obviously, it has no transport capacity, and it comes with uh, two heavy bolters on the sponsons, a las cannon on the hull, and a battle cannon on the turret. Yep, you can have a bolt-on bolter and the grenade launchers, like every other tank. So again, four locations, just like the Predator. You got the track, the hull, the, the uh, heavy bolters, or the turret. And it puts a star there because I guess the heavy bolters also include the last cannon. Huh. Cool. Hit the one nearest to the attacker. Okay, so unlike the dreadnought that hold that had right arm, left arm, this one depends on which side you're on, as which sponsor you hit. Makes total sense. Moving on to the Sentinel. There you go. They actually did have Sentinels back then, even though the current model wasn't out yet. Uh, in Rogue Trader, they had like kind of these like egg-shaped Sentinels, which I think are wicked cool. I would love to get my hands on a few of them, just because they're so neat looking. Uh, I actually had one of the old metal sentinels that were around in this edition, and uh, it wasn't that silly egg shape. It actually looked more like uh, more like the sentinels now, I guess, but it didn't have the like ATST appearance to it. It kind of was like a, it looked almost like a little car with legs. You know what I mean? With a dude sitting on the top of it. I had one of these. Um, I think I destroyed the like just painted it horribly and and probably later on converted it, so I don't have it anymore. Um, because I just had it in such bad condition. But you gotta remember, I was 11 years old when this stuff came out. Uh, or when I started actually using it. And uh, there we go. Damage table, you got legs, the assault cannon, the body, or the Imperial Guardsman crew. And again, Imperial Guardsman crew does not have a damage table you roll on, whereas the other locations do. This you're just wounding him less if he was a human. Duplicate of that. This is something cool to note because, again, like I say, the squats were not really included in this edition, but they were in a way. They just never got a codex. Like, they literally decided during this edition 
that that was the army they were going to take out of the edition. But they still had rules, nonetheless, until 3rd edition came out when they were just no more. Um, so we have the heavy bike, which is sort of the equivalent of a tack bike, I suppose. Um, except that it had a dude on the back with a heavy weapon. Um, so, you got, yep, just like the attack bike, you got a driver and a gunner. Very similar to a Space Marine attack bike. Uh, it's got a multi melta and the bolters on the bike. So, again, just pretty much exactly the, the same as an attack bike. And same thing, you either hit the crew or the bike, just like the, the Space Marine attack bike. Uh, it will be interesting to note, though, that the squats are a toughness 4 with a 6 up armor save, whereas the guardsmen were a toughness 3 with a 5 up armor save, and the space marines are toughness 4 with a 3 up armor save. So, literally, they're, they're like pretty much the exact same thing, except that obviously the crew are different based on their race. And also, we have a squad bike, just like the space marine bike. Nothing really different there. It's armed with bolters, it literally is a space marine bike. So that has a squat rider, and same thing, he's toughness 4 with a 6 up armor save, unlike the Space Marines for toughness 4 with a 3 up. <clears throat> Everything else is the same as far as I can tell, and uh, I'm probably not going to read them in detail for you guys just because I want to uh, make this video as um, efficient as possible. So moving on to orc vehicles, we've got a battle wagon. This. Um, this vehicle was actually really cool, because if I remember correctly, uh, you could fit as many orcs on it as could physically fit on the model, rather than the Rhino, for example, that said it could carry 10 Space Marines or 5 Terminators. This one, you could literally fit as many orcs on the model as you possibly could actually physically fit on the model. But as you moved it, if any of them fell off, they would take a hit. So let's actually read the transport capacity here. Any number of models can fit or balance on the battle wagon can be carried by it. Any models which fall off during play are judged to have actually fallen off and the normal rules apply. So that would be like falling off any other vehicle. I'm not sure what those rules are off the top of my head, but I think that is stupid, stupid cool. Um, oh, obviously I have duplicates of that because like I say, one came in a codex probably and one came in the starter set or maybe one came in the starter set and one came in the dark millennium set. I don't really know. But like pretty much any other vehicle, um, except in this case it is open top, so we're seeing here the passengers are our location. Not the crew necessarily, the passengers. Now the driver of the tank is actually in an enclosed crew compartment, whereas the passengers are just all kind of like hanging out on top. So you could literally hit the passengers. And just like other tanks, it's got a hull and wheels in this case, as opposed to tracks, but pretty much the same difference. right? Yep, so it's just got one orc driver, and if you look at the actual picture on here, there is actually an enclosed compartment for the driver. So you're not actually going to ever hit the driver, you're only going to hit all the random dudes that are hanging out on top. Now, a knobs bike was different in this edition than it was, than it is in current editions. A knobs bike now is literally an orc bike with a knob driving it instead of an orc driving it. In this edition, the knobs didn't actually drive the bikes. A normal orc drove the bikes and the knobs just kind of hung out on the back. Uh, I believe squats had an equivalent too, where like you could have an, the nobility riding on the back of the bike where somebody else is driving it. So if you notice here with the crew, there is a driver and an orc knob. It's not just one model on the bike. Uh, I guess the knobs are so important that they're getting somebody else to drive them around, which is Kind of cool, I guess, but obviously they changed that later on down the road. So, of course, it's basically a bike. I would imagine it would have the same rules as all the other bikes, with the exception that obviously it's armed with heavy bolters, I believe, what are now uh, called DACA guns. But let's, let's just take a good look at that. Because, yeah, it's not actually showing any weapons here. It says actually that the bike is unarmed itself. The knob riding it may fire weapons. Hmm, that's interesting to note because the cur the bike that we had from Gorka Morka was pretty much the bike that we were using. Of course, there were metal bikes, pewter bikes that came out in Rogue Trader, which were being used up until the Gorka Morka set come out. 
But after the Gorko Marker set came out, we had a plastic bike to play with, and uh, obviously it was much smaller than the current plastic bike, but it did have two big guns on the side of it, um, which in third became DACA guns, but I swear I remember the bike having uh, like heavy bolters or something on it in this edition. Because you remember orc weapons were the same as human weapons in this edition. They hadn't created Slugga and Choppa uh, and all that stuff. They literally had bolt pistols and chain swords, the same as you know, Space Marine models would. And there you go, I had a duplicate again. Here we go, now we got the war bike. Ooh, it had auto cannons, not heavy bolters. Ooh, that's interesting to note. Because Grotz also didn't have Grot blasters. They had uh, auto guns, right? So orcs literally had bolters, bolt pistols, auto guns, plasma guns, all that kind of shit, right? Um, so we've got auto cannons on the basic orc bike. And again, we've got one orc rider. So as opposed to the space marine bikes, which have bolters on them, the orc bikes have auto cannons. Ew, that is so gross. And just like other bikes, you either hit the rider or you hit the bike. Damage respectively. Toughness 4 with a straight 6 up armor save. Exactly like any other arc. And again, I've got duplicates of that one. Now we're moving on to the... So actually, I'll, I'll show you the picture of that up close. Just out of nostalgia. That is the pewter model. And if you can see, the weapons almost look more like las cannons than auto cannons. But regardless, that is what it is. Um... Now, we've got an orc buggy. Again, that's the old Rogue Trader pewter buggy. Weird looking model, right? Of course, when they came out with Gorka Marka, um, right before 3rd edition dropped, we got the new plastic buggy model, which is still currently our plastic buggy, which I really hope they give the orcs new plastics when they come out with a codex in 8th because that plastic model should not be in the range anymore. I have no idea why they haven't made new ones. Although I have seen some cool uh, conversions done with the plastic truck. You can actually turn a plastic truck into two buggies, which is neat. But anyway, regardless, uh, much like the attack bike kind of idea, we have one arc driver and one arc gunner. And then we actually have a selection of different heavy weapons you can take, a heavy bolter, a multi-melta, a las cannon, an auto cannon, a heavy plasma gun, uh, which has two settings, just like we're used to seeing now. And I believe it had an armor of 10. Yep, there you go. Armor of 10, just like a bike, or an attack bike, or in this case, I suppose, a knob bike. Uh, and the locations, respectively, just like all other bikes. That was basically a bike. Now we have the war track, so there you go. That's the current plastic war track, which came out in, in Gorka Marka. If I, yep. So I also have the data slate, probably from the starter set, where it's got the old pewter war track. So there you go, it actually looks very similar to a knob bike, except that it has a heavy weapon on the back of it. So once again, just like the buggy, you literally have an arc driver and an arc gunner, much like you would on an attack bike. Um, yeah, actually, it's really not all that different, except that it has a much larger selection of heavy weapons. Just like the buggy, it has all the heavy bolter, multi melt last cannon, auto cannon, or heavy plasma cannon. No auto, no auto cannons unless you actually purchase an auto cannon to put on the back of it. Even though the bikes have two, which is kind of weird. And this is interesting to note: the buggy had armor ten all around, whereas the track actually has a armor twelve on its side and rear. So it's actually better armored hmm, than a buggy. That's kind of neat. Here we go again, another war track data sheet. Scorches, or Scorcher, it says here, if they hadn't incorporated all that weird A business yet. Um, it was basically a war track except the old model had like a little garbage can on the back of it that would spin around that had like a flamer on it a heavy flamer i think it actually was yeah it says here a heavy flamer with a 360 fire arc and this is interesting note and that is an orc driver an orc gunner and one snotling <laughs> cool so yep heavy flamer there you go and Cool, so here you go, unlike the uh, buggies and tracks and stuff, which only had the two locations, you can hit the driver, you can hit the turret, 
You could hit the Scorcher, which is the actual Heavy Flamer itself, I suppose, and a Fuel Tank, which actually was bolted to the back of it. If you look at both the old Rogue Trader model and the later uh, Pewter model that matched the pla that used the plastic uh, War Track kit, uh, it literally had like a trailer behind it with a big fuel tank on it. There it is. There. That's the uh, plastic one, which had the extra pewter bits, as you can see. I guess that's supposed to be the snotling hanging out on the on the fuel tank. Wicked cool, right? And then uh, let's see. Yeah, I don't actually have the one for showing the Rogue Trader one, but you guys can take check it out on Google. Go back and take a look. I actually had one of the old Rogue Trader ones back in the day, which I later chewed up for pieces for other vehicles because I love converting. So there's the old Orc Dreadnought. This is the one that they actually gave you the cardboard cutout of in the set. In fact, I'll pull that out right now if I can. Yeah, whatever. We're going to dig through this box in a minute. I just wanted to show you these data faxes to start. There you go. Anyway, that's the Orc Dreadnought. Believe it or not, it had a Gretchen crew. Weird, right? Because now the cans are mar manned by Grotz and the dreads are manned by Orcs. Um, in third edition, when they actually converted everything in order, the can over the cans and the dreads were both armed or, or powered, crewed by Orcs, and then they later changed the cans back to being crewed by Grotz, uh, which kind of miffed me a bit. But it's interesting to note that a dreadnought is crewed by a Gretchen, not an Orc. I guess orcs don't have the patience to lumber up slowly. They really want to get into the fight and they're not going to jump into a dread, right? Also something interesting to note that in the fluff, an orc dread is not like a space marine dread where it's a dead guy hooked to like a life support device. It was literally a vehicle that they could get in and out of. So that being said is what it is. And much like the space marine dread, the locations are very similar. We hit either the legs, the left arm or right arm and the body. So again, no chance of hitting the crew. They're fully encased in the vehicle. And I have four of these. Wow. Okay. And we're moving on to an Orc War truck. So that's the plastic Orca Morca one. That we finally got a new plastic one back in uh, 4.5 slash 5th edition. Um, but this was the plastic of... I'm, I'm, I'm really myth that they haven't replaced the buggies yet, but this is the Gorka Morka plastic. There was an even older truck model, an older Rogue Trader truck model, which much like the old uh, Rogue Trader war track I showed you is kind of silly looking, but it is what it is nonetheless. Um, again, a driver and a gunner, has a transport capacity, may carry... oh! Cool, just like the battle wagon. It may carry as many orc models as may be sensibly fitted onto the back. Obviously if models are falling off from time to time, or you're using sticky tape, then you are trying to carry too many. <laughs> uh, so funny. And just like the tracks and the buggies and all that, you're either hitting the truck or you're hitting the passengers. There you go. I guess crew are included as passengers. Ooh, we're moving into LR data faxes. So there you go, there's a jet bike, very similar to a Space Marine bike, it's just got one crew, and it is fitted with a shuriken catapult. Uh, the shuriken catapults may be replaced with a single shuriken cannon for five points. Cool, and they've given you the stats for the catapult and the cannon. Interesting to note, it has an armor 12 on the front, whereas 10 everywhere else, where the other bikes are armor 10, the orc bikes are armor 10, space marine bikes are armor 10. I guess that's because of that weird front shield. They actually uh, make it harder to penetrate at the front, which is kind of neat. We've got the Eldar Viper, Viper jet bike, so much like an attack bike for the Eldar flying around. We've got a driver and a gunner, much like the attack bike. Uh, yep, just like attack bikes, it has the shirt and catapults on the bike itself, and then the back guy has like a heavy weapon, shirt and cannon, or scatter laser, or heavy plasma gun. That's interesting. 
I have yet to ever see a Viper model, even back in Second and Rogue Trader, that has a plasma cannon on the back of it. But maybe I could do some research and find that, because I'd be interested in seeing that. And, yep, just like a jet bike. It's got a front armor 12, so it's basically a jet bike with two crew instead of one. Just like the attack bike is a space marine bike with two crew instead of one. And an extra heavy weapon added onto it. Then I got the old war walkers. Check out that old pewter war walker, guys. It's actually not all that different from the current plastic. But it's interesting to note that it's on a square base. And it actually has like, the sides are like basically the same pewter pieces like the heavy weapons platforms that came in the Guardians. Wild, right? So a war walker has one Guardian crew. Uh, again, can be given a selection of different heavy weapons. Scatter lasers, last cannons, heavy plasma guns, or missile launchers. And again, like I say, um, for the most part, all the races shared the same weapons. So like a Bright Lance wasn't a Bright Lance yet. It was still a LAS cannon for everybody, even Eldar. Uh, but they did have scatter lasers, um, Shuriken catapults, uh, which I don't believe are taken by other races. Scatter lasers might have been able to be taken by Imperial Guard, but that's about it as far as Eldar weapons. The Shuriken Cannon and stuff like that is obviously unique to the Eldar, but a Missile Launcher is a Missile Launcher, a Heavy Plasma Gun is a Plasma Cannon, is the same for everybody, a LAS Cannon is the same for everybody. And uh, on the War Walker we actually have four different locations, much like a Dreadnought I guess. We have the legs, ah interesting, there's no arms per se because they're just straight heavy weapons. So we have legs, weapons, uh, Eldar slash engine, so I guess it's the crew slash the engine sitting that he's sitting on. Because more or less, as you can see, the thing is just pretty much legs and a Guardian sitting on top of an engine with two weapons beside him. Uh, and it's interesting to note that its armor value is actually 18. So it's really well armored. And even though the, uh, it looks like the Guardian's exposed there, fluff-wise they made it like, oh, well, there's like a force field in front of him or something silly like that. But regardless, moving on to the Eldar Dreadnought. This is what we currently know as a Wraith Lord. And you can see the old metal model with a massive sort of head on it. It actually looks pretty cool. I, I'm not going to lie. I actually have one of these in my Eldar Exodite army. Um, I also have some of the new plastic one. Uh, both of which I've converted to be like sort of like big walking tree men kind of thing. But regardless, uh, this model I think is actually really cool as far as the old models are concerned. And again, see it on a square base, because I guess they hadn't really uh, differentiated bases and stuff and how important that was. You gotta understand too, 40k basically rose out of Warhammer Fantasy, so it was not unheard of to have square bases in 40k, because a lot of the models would transfer to either game. Uh, crew, it says special, which is interesting. Actually, let me just take a look at that for a second and why it says that. So it's armed with two power fists, each with a shuriken catapult built into it, or a flamer with a 90 degree fire arc. Upgraded to carry a distortion cannon, a las cannon, a missile launcher, a heavy plasma gun, or a scatter laser. Hmm. And I don't know what kind of crap I got on this card, but there's something really hardened on there, that kind of sucks because it's, you know, I like to keep my classic stuff in as mid condition as possible, but I don't know why it says specifically special, but I guess because it doesn't really have a crew, it actually holds the soul of an Eldar, um, so instead of a crew, we've got the head, which is basically the bulk of the model, um, so either it's the legs, the right arm or left arm, or the head, just like a dreadnought. I guess the head is the hull, because it really is just a big walking head. Um, so really there's three damage tables, but again, it matters which arm you hit based on, you know, which claw you're taking off, I suppose. And that is the Eldar Dreadnought. All right, sorry guys, I just had to stop the camera there and organize this a little bit, because again, I've had this box for years, and I just kind of threw everything into it, um, so it was a little unorganized. I just took a second to sort it all out for you so I can easily show you guys the sheer amount of cardboard that you needed for this edition of the game. So, first off, we'll start with the warp decks. These came in the, uh... I'm not sure if you got one in the starter set or not, but you definitely got one in the Dark Millennium. And I actually have two copies of it. 
So I'm going to pull out these cards and just show you um, the kind of stuff that was available for your hand. Uh, these were the ones that you drew the cards of to be able to cast your powers. So you needed these to be able to cast your powers, like we saw the Force 3, Force 2. So if you wanted to cast a Force 2, you actually had to have two of these in your hand. So like I say, you roll a d6 for every Psyker on the field. There's three Psykers on the field, you roll three d6, and that's how many cards each player gets. And then in your cards, you pull out these. I want to do a Force 3 power, so I flip down the, the power card, put these three Force cards on top of it, and then I get to use it. And the only way people could stop it is by either having one of these Nullify cards in their hand, or uh, there was also a uh, Reflection, there you go, or you could reflect the power back at the person. There was a Destroy power, so literally you could destroy that Psychic power. And then there were things like Psychic Duel, which was not a power itself, but you could use it to sort of battle the enemy Psyker. And then there was a demonic attack, very similar to like a Perils of the Warp nowadays, where you could literally have a demon attack them. Um, and I believe that is everything. Those are all, oh, an ultimate force. That just basically means you don't need multiple cards to cast the power. It literally just goes off and there's nothing the enemy can do to stop it. So if you got that one, as you can see, this is a full deck and there was only one ultimate force deck in the entire thing. There's like three or four nullifies. I think I saw four nullifies. One psychic duel, one demonic attack, and like two or three. Destroy power. One destroy power, one psychic duel, one psychic attack. Three or four nullifies. Yeah, I can see four nullifies, five, six nullifies actually. Um, and that, that, that's that. So, let's dig into the ridiculous amount of cardboard that you needed for this edition of the game. I guess cardboard was cheap back then because they actually also gave you, in the set, an Orc Dreadnought. Which had his data facts on the back. So rather than include the model, which at the time was like a big expensive pewter model, which looked just like that actually. They gave you this guy in the starter set with this little stand. So you could put him on a base. And it'll really have that represent your Arc Dreadnought on the field. Insane, right? Just to get you started, just to get things going. Well, actually, since I've got them here, I might as well show you guys the dice. So we discussed the Scatter Dice, the Artillery Dice, and the Sustained Fire. So the Scatter Dice, we should be used to seeing, because it was used up until the current edition of the game, and we still use it in Horus Heresy. Um, the Artillery Dice disappeared from 40k a long time ago, but it was used up until 8th edition fantasy, I believe, and there you go. So really, most of the time you were rolling a scatter and an artillery, and that will give you the distance that it went, but then there was also a chance of misfiring, and that was really used for artillery weapons, thud guns, you know, other artillery and stuff. And the sustained fire was for assault cannons and heavy bolters and things like that. I just threw one across the field. These have actually had a resurgence now. We have these in Necromunda. Uh, which is kind of cool, because they literally disappeared for like 20 years, and now they're back. Uh, and that just meant your assault cannon either fired one shot, two shots, three shots, or it jammed. Hence the lightning bolt sort of thing. Uh, if I remember correctly, assault cannons actually rolled two of these, I think. Heavy bolters might have rolled one. It just shows a variable uh, shot, and of course, there was a chance when firing that many bullets that your stuff is going to misfire. So I've just got a couple of these in here. I've actually got a few more of them in other uh, dice cases, but I threw them in here just in case I lose my other ones and just to sort of show um, the use for this edition. Bam, moving on. They also gave you these sort of turn counter things so you can literally track your victory points as the game goes on. Uh, it looks like we only have a four turn max here, which is interesting to note because I do remember, I do remember back in the day, I think we, our games only went four turns. And like I say, at 2,000 points, I believe I've said this before, 2,000 points, um, it literally took us like four hours to play four turns because this, this is just so convoluted, this rule system. But, you know, we would make a day out of it. We would, my buddy had his ping pong table and we would set up our armies and we would literally just play all day and like take a break halfway through for pizza and maybe play some chess to get our brains off of this game and then get back to it, you know what I mean? 
Uh, and yeah, it's just showing you how you score victory points. Of course, we have those mission cards that I showed you, which we're going to add to this. Um, so that is your victory point record chart. Neat, right? Uh, and of course, as they've done in every edition, they give you a rules summary. This is all the basic rules you need to play the game. All sort of recorded on one sheet. We've got the turn phase, how everything works with breaking and rallying, special rules. Uh, they give you a little short weapons table. I guess is the most common weapons used in the game, or maybe even at least the stuff that came in the starter set. But also we've got this weapon summary, which pretty much summarizes pretty much all the weapons, at least for um, the core sets. The ones that are included in the Codex Imperialis for pretty much all races and stuff like that. Yeah, we got even Ban Banshee masks on there and everything. Yeah. So there you go. Weapon summary, rule summary. Super handy to have next to you while you're playing. And now let's look at all the crazy templates for this edition. So I actually pulled off to the side here. I want to show you guys that first before we jump into this. They gave you wound counters, uh, a turn counter. We've got these little things I guess can represent objectives for the um, Imperium and the Orcs. The wound counters have these cool skulls on the back. Now these aren't popped out because like I say we had multiple edition or multiple copies of this set back in the day and I believe I've even purchased one on eBay since just so I could have all of the second edition stuff. Now all of these I have in another container so I haven't popped these out because I like keeping things in like I say as mid condition as possible. We've got these ones too which I believe uh, came in the, yep they came in the starter set because there's the flame, flame template pop out. So the jams for your sustained fire dice, flamed to show when things are on fire, we got fast speed, combat speed, and slow speed. Just so you can put a reminder next to your vehicle, you know what, what it's doing. These guys, this is for guys that have run, so move double their movement, which means they can't fight or shoot. Detected, there you go, for hidden models and stuff like that, and out of control, just to remind yourself that in your next movement phase, your vehicle is moving out of control. And there you go, on the back, we've got hidden, on the back of the detected ones, so they're hidden, and then when they're detected, you just flip it over. And uh, these ones just represent guys in Overwatch, so you can remind yourself in your enemy turn that they are in Overwatch, and I guess they put the jams on the other side of it, just to save paper. Here we've got Recharge and Broken. It's interesting. So like, I guess weapons took a turn to recharge kind of thing, and then Broken is for the guys that failed their leadership tests, and they are the same token, just printed on both sides. Now, these are the old cardboard ruins they gave you in the set. Pretty cool, right? I mean, everything back then, Necromunda, Gorka Marka, they pretty much did all the sets out of cardboard. And this was just to get you started, so literally you just folded it like that, and you put this guy on the corner. You know what I mean? Just to sort of hold it square. And that was our battlefield. Like I say, we had a couple of uh, versions, we had a couple of copies of this. So after two or three of us bought the starter set, we had enough uh, terrain to basically fill a battlefield. And of course we built some stuff out of, you know, random styrofoam packaging and stuff like that back in the day. Before we actually knew anything about this stuff. Nothing like the trash terrain I'm doing on the channel now. Obviously my skills have improved in 20 years, and if they hadn't, then I would feel really bad about it. But uh, there we go, so we've got a bunch of the tokens already popped out. We've actually got some of the templates here. So when they talk about... Um, so we basically got the equivalent, what do I have here? I have the two inch template. Oh, so when they say two inch template, they don't actually mean the little two inch template, they mean this guy, who's actually four inch. This is our blast marker we're used to seeing in later editions. This is the three inch template, which here they've uh, called the one and a half inch template. Again, a one and a half radius, two inch radius. So this is actually a little smaller than what we call the ordinance template. That would be five. This one's actually four inches across. This one's three inches across. It's interesting to note. And uh, here we also have the three inch template, which is quite a bit bigger than the current, or yeah, I guess it's current in 30K, current ordinance template, uh, which is five inch. So this would actually be six inch. Yikes. Um, was there a five inch in this edition? It doesn't look like it. So we have a three, three inch, four inch, and six inch. I got multiple copies of that, obviously. 
Um, now, I did mention to you when we were going over artillery and stuff, that sort of artillery template. So here it is, guys. And they expect you to pop out the center and sort of put a thumbtack in there. Uh, so this is how sort of barrages worked. Oh, there was one more round template I should know. This is what I thought they meant by two inch template. It's actually calling it a one inch template. It is two inches across. So we got two, three, four, and six diameter. Or one, one and a half, three. One, one and a half, two, and three radius. There you go. And there was a whole bunch of these little tiny templates, and that's exactly what this uh, artillery template is. But like I say, there was like a little tail on it, and literally what you did is you poked a thumbtack through there and through there, and that's how you worked out your barrages. And unlike, uh, you know, third and fourth and so on, where you had this and then you flipped another one and flipped another one. That was how they did it in later editions, because they wanted to decrease the number of templates that you needed for the game which I made total sense because we would lose templates all the time and I just happen to have all of these because like I say I try to hold on to it and trying to keep it uh, as mint as possible really just so I can look back and as you can see here you literally there if you can see there are numbers written around the outside much like the blast template in infinity nowadays how you roll a d20 to see what's around the outside this one's actually a d12 so it's basically a clock face and so you rolled a 11, you place that down, you roll an 11, the next one goes there, and then you would roll another die, oh, I placed the wrong one, you would roll another die, so you rolled a 10, that one would go there, you rolled a 2, it would go there, see, making sense? Cool. Moving on, we got another one of those. Oh, the flame templates is something really worth talking about, because we actually had three sizes of flame templates in this edition. So. We've got the hand flamer template, the flamer template, and the heavy flamer template. And you can really see the difference in sizes, right? Check that out. So hand flamers actually fired a little tiny flame burst. Flamers fired this flame burst, and then heavy flamers was this. And then later they changed it in third to just be this template for all flame weapons. Which is cool, but in many ways kind of silly too. Uh, when they first converted the third, I said to myself, I was like, why would a heavy flamer fire the same amount of flame as a normal flamer? That's silly. It's so much bigger. But I guess they just did it with strength and AP and stuff like that to differentiate them. And hand flamers almost disappeared for a while until they brought back the witch hunter rules for the Sisters of Battle. Uh, so, moving on, what else we got here? We got that Vortex template, we were looking at that Vortex grenade in yesterday's video, and then the Vortex psychic power in today's video. So that's the Vortex template they were talking about, and it's the same as the Small Blast. I shouldn't say Small Blast, because it's not the smallest, but it's the same as the 3 inch, I'm sorry, the 2 inch template, which is a 4 inch template. So that's the one you place and it would float around, right? Uh, we also have... That was one. This is actually one from the old 5th edition fantasy set, but it's the same size. Kind of cool. It's just marked differently. Interesting that I put it in there. These are a, a buzzer squig bomb. This is actually, as you can see, it's like basically paper because I had to cut that out of the orc, orc codex. That's the same size as the little template. Um, I've also mentioned to you that foot of gork thing. That's the template. How cool is that, guys? It's literally like a foot cracked the earth. Super cool. And uh, this would be that orc psychic power. I was saying how you place that in front and it like shoots forward. That was literally the template, which is basically half of um, your blast template, right? Just leaving enough here for a 25 mil base. You literally put it on the front of his base and then shot it forward which is cool. And then uh, I think the only thing I haven't mentioned to you guys is this little gubbin right here, which is your vehicle turning template. So in order to turn vehicles, like I wanted to turn my Rhino, I literally had to place this against the side of it, and then I could turn it like that, right? Or actually, I believe it was the other way around. I placed, it, placed this on the front of it, and then I could turn right so, right? And it literally shows a little Land Raider there, turning, showing you how to use it. That's the vehicle turning template. 
So I believe that is everything as far as all of the stuff that comes in this set. I just really hope you guys enjoyed that because that was a blast in the past for me. And I love the nostalgia of looking back over all this crazy stuff. So I know it's taken a few videos guys, but I hope you've enjoyed this look at the second edition of Warhammer 40,000. Now we've gone through all of the core material that made it possible for you to play a proper game of Warhammer 40,000 second edition. So now we can start into the codices. I'm going to be showing you guys in the next few videos all of the codexes uh, all the way through, at least all the ones I have, and I think I have them all, but uh, if not, please let me know as we go. But uh, now I can finally start showing you guys the, the codexes. So I hope you enjoyed that look at all the core stuff. I definitely had a good time because this is basically the edition that I started playing the game in. So that really gave me a nice look back at my sort of junior high years uh, playing Warhammer with my buddies in the basement. So I hope you guys enjoy our content. If you do, hit the subscribe button. Hit that little bell notification. We love getting subscribers. And please comment below. Comment on any of our other videos. Um, I love hearing comments and I try to get back to every single one of them. Uh, otherwise, if you guys really like our content, please head to the description below and check out our Patreon campaign. Uh, for very little money, as much or as little as you want to give, you get a whole bunch more content. Uh, also, it gets you 10% off thewarpainter.com, a great Canadian supplier of hobby supplies, which we've recently hooked up with, who is offering all of our patrons a discount, so that's pretty awesome. And you can get all your uh, paints, scale 75 Vallejo, shipped right to your front door. Uh, otherwise, please hit the subscribe button, share it on Facebook, and we'll see you at our next encounter. Like a monkey in a rocket on his way back home. Okay.